Good morning, and welcome to day two of the 2022 Virtual Reverse Site Visit. My name is Sally Buck, and I'm the CEO at the National Rural Health Resource Center and Program Director for the Technical Assistance Service Center, or TASC. I will start with some housekeeping items. As we get started, a few details about the CVENT platform we are using. As a registered attendee, you are given a special link to join this event, and from that link, you can access all the plenary, breakout, and discussion sessions. Aside from discussion rooms, each plenary and breakout will be recorded and made available at the same RSV event link shortly after the session concludes. The recordings will also be made available at the center website in the coming weeks. Slides are posted below the bios for each session. If you need technical assistance for this event, please call 833-987-3703 or email rhrcsupport at cvent.com. And those will be posted in the chat as well. We encourage your questions and their interactions with the speakers. If you have questions or comments during this session, you may utilize the chat box feature by clicking on the chat icon on the right side of your event screen. The task team will be monitoring the chat during the presentation, either answering your questions directly or communicating them to the speaker. This year is the 25th anniversary of the Balanced Budget Act of 1997, which saw the creation of the new designation, Critical Access Hospital. Since that time, over 1,300 hospitals have made that conversion to the designation with financial and quality viability. Thousands of rural communities have made strides to maintain access to care. The Balanced Budget Act also created the Medicare Rural Hospital Flexibility Program, or FLEX program. We've come a long way since 1997. Innovation and adaptation to modify the FLEX program and the way we provide care in our critical access hospitals. The internet is now the backbone of our society and telehealth has become a prominent mode of healthcare delivery. More hospitals are adopting value-based payment models and we are seeing access to care aligning with health equity, including cultural awareness. Addressing disparities such as transportation, high-speed internet, and access to healthy food have all risen in prominence. In this connected world, the FLEX program has seen rapid changes to the approach and methods. Yet one thing has remained constant in the last 25 years. None of this is possible without all of you. The work you do for the hospitals in your states and your communities is felt by millions of people and will leave a legacy lasting for generations. Thank you. To comment more on this, I will turn it over to Laura Seifert followed by Tom Morris from the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, a 4-HP, within the Health Resources and Services Administration. Laura has been with F4HP for two years and is a program coordinator for the FLEX program. Prior to coming to F4HP, Laura spent three and a half years living in Peru, working in Peace Corps in community development and public health education. Laura? Thank you so much, Sally. It's an honor to be here presenting with you all today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give you our slides that we have ready to go for our FORHP welcome and our FLEX team welcome. I'm going to introduce briefly as we go along our two other FLEX project officers, Talia and um, Natalia. My screen is ready to share. Um, so as you can see right here, we're just going to do a really quick update for you on what's going on here with our hospital state division um, and our flex team. We've got some staffing updates, but we've got a lot of content for you ready today. So we're going to talk quickly. Um, the first thing I want to say to all of you before we get started and everything else is just a giant and loud thank you. I know we have a lot of new flex coordinators that have started this year. Um, and I know a lot of flex is overwhelming when you get started, but you all are doing so well. And I want to say a big thank you to all of our other flex coordinators who have stuck it out for the last couple of years. I know things have been really difficult with COVID and I'm so honored to get to tell everyone that I work with the best team in the country. Um, and I think you all have done really well. We know the theme of this reverse site visit this year is adaptation, innovation, and equity. And you all have really done some wonderful things in the past couple of years. Um, to to work in, the, in these trying times that we didn't really know were going to happen. So um, to kick us off super quick, 
I'll give you an update here just on our hospital state division staff. As you know, Christy Martinson is our division director and Rachel is our deputy director. We only have a couple of updates that have changed from last year. Um, many of you know our new ship coordinator, Krista Mastel, has jumped on board. Um, and the biggest news that we have this week, we are very excited. We have our new Flex project officer, Kathleen Laguna, who's going to be joining us. Um, we're going to be getting her slowly caught up to speed and introduced to the states that she'll be working with. Um, and we also have a Pathways intern uh, who's going to be working with us, Jennifer, who's getting her master's in health um, administration. So we've got lots of things happening over here on the hospital state division team. And we're hoping um, to have some great updates for you in the future. We do want to take a super quick second to just recognize, especially from this time last year, just to think about how many things have happened and how much you all have accomplished. We were just having a brand new conversation on our Flex Quality Innovation Labs last year. It was a new idea. We were just putting out what topics we were working on, um, everything. And look at how far you all have come. There have been a lot of bumps in the road, and we know that. <laughs> but we know a lot of the states have come to us and said, we changed our topic. We had to change our approach. And it's so wonderful and gratifying to see you all and the work that you've accomplished. Um, and prior to last year, you know, us as the Flex team, we implemented our logic models. And we were doing a lot of conversations on the impact of COVID on the FLEX program. Um, but to transition, because we really are excited on what we're doing now and where we're going, I am going to kick it over to my colleague, Talia Chapel, and she's going to tell us a little bit about what's been going on this past year in EMS. Talia? Thanks, Laura. Um, so there are currently 30 states working within the optional program area of EMS, and that's an increase of two states uh, from the last fiscal year. Uh, there are lots of good EMS projects being implemented. However, I only have time to cover a couple. So first I'm going to mention the Washington Flex program, which has been providing scholarships to EMS providers to attend leadership trainings, as well as offsetting the training expense for volunteers to become certified EMT basic level providers. Um, so far, 24 participants have received leadership training and 35 have received vouchers from EMT basic training. I'd also like to uh, mention Alabama, who last year held a hospital learning and action network with an education on the benefits of community paramedicine and how it can impact the treatment of patients with chronic diseases such as diabetes. Now this year, that same Learning Action Network is building on that education with a pilot program of sorts. One of the cause from that Learning Action Network is now working on implementing a community paramedicine program. I really encourage you to consider adding EMS activities to your work plan if you haven't already. There are a lot of ways to use flex dollars to help support your rural EMS agencies. Um, I'd also like to mention two projects that are underway uh, with a couple of our partners. So Arkita is currently revamping their QI basics course and adding in EMS specific examples. Uh, we're taking a little extra time on this right now, but you'll be hearing more once everything is completed and ready to share. It will be worth the wait, I promise. Um, and additionally, our partners at TASC have been doing so much to support EMS work within FLEX. Uh, one project I'd like to highlight is the work to pilot and improve a tool that the Paramedic Foundation put together. So this tool is meant to help EMS agencies calculate the value that they provide to their communities um, and to also give an indicator of financial distress. Uh, so, and then last but not least, I do have a brief update on the EMS supplements. So that, as many of you know, um, this is the final year for the fiscal year 19 EMS supplements. You heard yesterday, if you were in the breakout, um, from Arizona and Ohio on their lessons learned and how they plan to move their projects forward. So we're looking forward to future updates from both Arizona and Ohio, as well as the other six states that have participated in this supplemental funding opportunity so that we can continue to share lessons learned with one another. The FY22 EMS uh, supplements will be awarded sometime next month to six states for a two-year project period focused on improved data submission for EMS measures 
and quality improvement activities at the agency level. So I just want to say I appreciate everyone's work on the current supplements and looking forward to the new projects that are going to be starting in September. And now I will turn it over to Natalia. Thank you so much, Talia. Uh, today, I will just uh, do a quick overview of where we are with quality improvement. And um, I just want to thank you for all of your efforts and your patience. I think this is a very uh, complex topic that we are trying to navigate. There are measures, measures everywhere. And I think um, the hardest challenge for us at FORP is trying to find what are the, the meaningful measures that we have for, um, and opportunities for measurement in the rural um, space. So for that work, is all of it includes all of the behind the scenes work that we do with our partners to really think through what um, trajectory we want to take the program to. And um, you've been so gracious to share with us your feedback on the activities that you do in program area one. We're working at the moment um, to integrate that feedback as we um, look to establish a rural and equip measure core set that will drive improvement activities within the rural healthcare system. And so for that, you know, we're really thankful for all of your feedback. It really means a lot to hear um, what the stories that you hear from the ground is what we use to inform the changes that we're making. We're seeking um, alignment uh, with other federal programs, but also seeking to create um, a more relevant measure set that addresses the needs of the rural facilities. And for that work, we couldn't do it without your partnership. Um, we're continuing um, our work to identify other opportunities for what type of facilities um, would be also impacted uh, with in innovations in, in um, care delivery that, that would require measurement. And so we're looking at your uh, specific feedback on how you're working with rural health clinics, with nursing homes, and just other facilities that intersect with the work that we do with critical access hospitals. So for that, we're trying to prioritize as best as we can any upstream strategies or just trying to, to listen to what happens on the ground to um, address any challenges that we have in measure reporting and also looking at how do we overcome the challenges that we are left with after you know, facing COVID-19 um, issues. Uh, specifically, you know, we know that, that rural hospitals were very much affected with capacity, but as we continue to prepare for you know, addressing these challenges, how can we work together to ensure that that bi-directional feedback is a continuous part of the program. And so, you know, at the moment, we're preparing to relaunch the, the MBQIP eligibility requirements. And we're looking to continue with those efforts to, to hear from you. Just um, that alone has been really meaningful for us as we develop a cohesive national quality um, improvement strategy. And so this would be the focus of uh, the work as we move forward with MBQIP. And like I said, is, is, is a lot that goes into it, but you know, we've come a long way. And I know my colleague, Laura mentioned where we were a year ago in, in terms of uh, forming the innovation labs, the quality innovation labs that, um, that we have supported through Flex Year 3. And we're just very proud of all the work that you have done, the innovative ways in which you came together as teams to work with one another, to really dig deep into the QI strategies that could be used and leveraged to improve the work that you do uh, with the hospitals. And also just amazed at the level of engagement with the hospitals as well. As you remember, we only um, required at least two hospitals uh, per state that would be engaged. And despite having all of the challenges that we had during the pandemic, we have over 400 hospitals that have been participating in the quality innovation lab projects. Uh, so that kind of representation is very meaningful for driving change into our program. And we look forward to just learning um, the overall um, lessons learned that were derived from applying this type of innovation 
in, the, in terms of how we work together to really address some of the challenges that we've been hearing about. Um, so even if you didn't do anything like particularly innovative, just the strategy of having this approach of forming teams of states to work together and talk about quality strategies to address those challenges, that type of innovation is, you know, what, what really breathes life into MBQIP. So we really appreciate all of that and we look forward to the uh, lessons learned that we have um, that hopefully will be synthesized as part of an evaluation that our partners are conducting in collaboration with one another. So more to share on that at some point in 2023. So keep your eye out for, the, for those learnings. And now I'd like to turn it back over to Laura, who will be... Um, Thank you so much, Natalia. Um, so I'll go ahead and kick us over to our financial and operational improvement section. Um, and just really quickly what we've been working on, you can see here, there's a lot going on in our partnerships. Um, we have FMT currently working on a project to um, kind of help us determine a lot more in the financial characteristics um, that are being measured by hospitals that are currently working in value-based care. Um, and then I know you've all have been receiving the emails on hospital leadership task. The two things, if you'll ask anyone on kind of where the direction this is going, would be value-based care and hospital leadership. And we know, as Caleb with Taos just sent me a quote the other day, without leadership, nothing else, nothing else happens. So we're really putting a focus on that. And there are, as you know, the great document from the Flex Monitoring team with the example outcome measures for the financial and operational improvement interventions uh, that is up on their website. You'll have the links to all of these when we get the slides posted in the attendee hub later. Um, and I just want to highlight a couple of quick things that some of the states are doing. Uh, and this is just some cool things, right, that not many people may hear about. So I think um, I want to kick it over to Ohio or Idaho, sorry, really quick. They've been doing a lot with Ide Bailey when we talk about leadership, but not just clinical leaders. They're working a lot with hospital boards and their board education training. And they've got an online platform that's been providing shorter sessions during board meetings, which we know boards are super busy and they don't have time for a lot. Um, and they also are going to be starting to collaborate with their state Medicaid office for a lot more value-based payment programs. Um, one of the other really cool collaborative things that uh, some of the states are doing would be up in New England. Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts work together in uh, with the New, New England Rural Health Association for their performance improvement collaborative. So all of those states collaborate together and take a, a little bit of the cost sharing to start providing reimbursement for certifications and educational trainings. And the one cool thing that happened in FY21 um, that I'm super excited about was Pennsylvania. Um, they have a program where they've been working for years with their Department of Human Services, Hospital Association, and State Medicaid Office. And all of that has formed a partnership really looking at Medicaid losses that need to be reimbursed to critical access hospitals. And when they got a consultant in there to do the TA, this past year in FY21 was the highest payout in the history of the program, and they got a payout of $34 million. Uh, so there's a lot of really wonderful things happening in the states in financial and operational improvement. So I really encourage you to all network with each other and see how you may be able to implement some of these in your states. Um, we will talk briefly about population health. Um, as you know, we were working last year to kind of get aligned with our FORHP Healthy Rural Hometowns Initiative. Um, and really incorporating quality measures as well within population health. So FMT, again, shout out to them. They gave us a really great evaluation and inventory of the existing health initiatives that are happening uh, in the state flex programs. Uh, so those are all up on the website. And I know for anyone who was in one of the breakouts yesterday with Alaska, Kate briefly talked about their health literacy program. And uh, this is just a quick highlight from them because it's such a cool program where now they've got the development of an entire health liter literacy web page um, to help out patients and families. So one thing we're really excited about, and I want to, we're going to talk about where we're going in the future, is outcomes, outcomes, and more outcomes. <laughs> and I know that this has been a bit of a, a transition as we work in a lot of this, but I have to say thank you all for your help in getting us started with this and the inclusion of those two to three outcome measures for your NCC reports in FY22. I can tell you, we all as a flex team are very excited about the data that we're going to get from this next year. And that excitement goes all the way up to our senior leadership here at FORHP. Um, so with that, we have the example outcomes for two of our program areas and there's going to be more to come. So stay tuned and we're going to get more from, F uh, from the flex monitoring team for population health and EMS. And, you know, I think you've all heard us talk about the fact that we're gearing up for our next competitive cycle in two more years. And I just have to give a big shout out to our partners in this because nothing could happen 
behind the scenes and anything that we do in the Flex program without all of our partners. And you can see this is just a tiny, tiny example of what they've been working on for us. FMT, you saw John's presentation yesterday on his future of Flex and the focus groups that he did. The presentation coming up later from Task, where they've updated the core competencies for Flex coordinators. Arkita has been working hard with Natalia doing an MBQIP refresh. All three of them have been working together in our quality innovation labs in this pilot program for us. So a big thank you to all of our partners for helping us get ready for what will be hopefully an exciting next competitive cycle. Um, and with that, that's just about it. Here is all of our contact information. We don't have a phone number yet for Kathleen. That's still being worked out with IT, but here is all of our emails. Um, please, I encourage you all to just reach out with us with questions, comments, concerns, ideas. We always want to hear from you on how we can make this program better. Um, and please connect with HRSA on any of our social media sites. And with that, I will stop my screen sharing. And I am going to turn it over to someone who probably does not need much of an introduction in this world, um, someone who's been involved in the FLEX program with the State Offices of Rural Health and specifically with the National Organization of State Offices of Rural Health, NOSOR, um, for several years and has just retired from her position as the CEO of NOSOR, uh, Terrell Isinger. I'm going to kick it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me see screen really quickly. How's that? Yep, great. Uh, hi, everybody. What an assignment I have to talk to you about the 25-year first quarter history of Flex in five to seven minutes or less. So uh, I'm delighted to be with you uh, here today. And uh, just let you know, I've never been a Flex coordinator. Uh, so I come at this uh, with a little bit different view uh, than others uh, do. And I'm having trouble flipping my slides. So sorry about that. Maybe Matt, you want to help me with that next slide? <laughs> Thank you. So uh, in my view of the world, I started working on uh, FLEX uh, on in the State Office of Rural Health 30 years ago before there was a FLEX program. And, uh, you know, so everything that I uh, incorporate and think about the history of FLEX is really tainted uh, with that overall background. So um, let me see. So uh, I have a little timeline for you that kind of lays out the view of the last 20, last quarter century. How do we get to a quarter century of that work? So when we started this work, um, we, yeah, and this little timeline shows that we wrote our, our, our state uh, Office of Rural Health grants around 1991. Back in those days, uh, we got about 45 to $50,000 uh, over the course of the years. Things just progressed. Back in the day, uh, around the time that the FLEX program was coming together, uh, we had such a very close partnership um, with the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. Federal Office of Rural Health Policy was tiny. Maybe a couple of people, I think Jerry Coopy was there. Um, Steve Hirsch worked at a place called the Rural Information Center. Um, and uh, around the time of the FLEX program, there was uh, Forrest Calico, who was really a champion for the state FLEX program. And then, of course, the State Office of Rural Health Directors who came together in partnership uh, with FRHP and our advocates uh, on the Hill to really envision and dream about a program called FLEX. Before there was FLEX, and I started with the Office of Rural Health, my boss, Carolyn Ford, who was one of the people who helped shape the program in the very beginning, I started work there and she had uh, created community delegates across the uh, state of Nevada. And um, so I was sent out to get to know what was happening in rural communities to talk to EMS people. When I remember when I went up to the northern part of Humboldt County in northeastern Nevada and talked to the EMS people, they said, don't tell anybody, but we're not just EMS. We're checking the safety in these houses and we're checking blood pressure and we're looking at pills. So guess what? That was really the birth of community paramedicine back there. Uh, we'd go and we'd talk to uh, county commissioners who at the beginning didn't know why we were even talking to them. We had to bring to their recognition the fact that hospitals were economic engines. Uh, we went to hospitals uh, back then. We called them administrators. And, um, and 
honestly, you couldn't get the time of the day with a hospital administrator. You know, you could talk about uh, state loan repayment program. There was a thing called the Quentin Burdick Interdisciplinary Training Program where you could bring them students. You might talk to them about, we had a small grant program uh, working on community development and you might catch their ear, but only when they were in trouble would they really reach out to you and, and really make a connection. So it really was when the FLEX program was created um, and when we got uh, that program in place and we started working on the designation of critical access hospitals, it's really when we saw the state and federal partnership really come together with communities uh, where we got traction. And don't get me wrong, it's not like it, it's not different than it is now. We were terrified. Uh, you know, we wanted to talk back then. We knew that we needed to understand uh, reimbursement better. And I could remember talking to somebody, it was called HICFA back then, not CMS. And we would talk and say, gosh, we need to learn to talk. To, we need to be making connections there and understanding reimbursement. And uh, one of my colleagues in another state office of rural health said to, said to me, well, why would we talk to them? We won't understand anything they say anyway. So it was just like, you know, it was terrifying. But what we did then is what you're doing now, um, where we reached out to the communities. We learned from the hospital CEOs. We reached out uh, to our partners at the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. We knew there was a model for something called REACH Peach, um, and each was a essential access community hospital, came out of Montana, I think. And then for some reason, the thing called a peach was actually a regional, it started with an R instead of a P. So we had to, you know, just like now, you have to learn those acronyms and you have to dig in and you under, have to understand the promising models. But we were terrified. So we went around the business of building on those partnerships that we had with communities, helping to educate community citizens, working with county commissions to understand and that work and uh, working with our partners and certainly our partners at FORHP, but also our corporate partners, folks like Stroudwater, back then it was Dixon Hughes, I Bailey, all of those folks that are an essential part of our work every day now that you depend on for their expertise. We relied on those partnerships too. Uh, also, back then, I can remember I, I loved listening uh, to the talk about measures and how important they are. We didn't really know what a measure was. We, uh, I remember talking to, uh, going to a big meeting and we'd have these meetings where we'd go back and forth and we'd debate things with FORHP and others and our partners and state offices. And somebody stood up in the room and we were talking about how were we gonna measure our work? And it was, it was Rita Selene from Georgia. And she stood up and she said, I don't wanna count how many times the duck flapped his wings. I wanna count how far the duck flew. Uh, so isn't that really wise? Even today, 30 years later, we're uh, relying on that kind of expertise that we had back then. Uh, we didn't really know uh, the partnerships that we had that we didn't really know and that we continue to do that. I wanna share besides this timeline, uh, one of the things on the timeline that I'll point out before we, uh, go back is back when NOSOR was formed, which is how I see the world through, you know, that end of the elephant task. Even then, uh, Terry Hill was our agent in charge when, uh, when NOSOR was founded. So uh, we have a long and rich history of working together uh, alongside the National Rural Health Resource Center. So next slide. So over the years, so much has happened. And I think one of the things that I've learned in my work uh, working with NOSOR is, you know, we can't, we'd like to to, I would like to sometimes ignore the current events, but I share three quotes from you from the past that really track and show some trends about what happened in the state flex program over the year. I remember when George Bush made an executive order that we would have electronic medical records to reduce lives. I can remember that day and thinking they can do that by an executive order. And I believe that's how I started. Somebody smarter than me can uh, correct my timeline. So we went about the business, uh, Sally and I and, and no sore folks and folks at FRHP, we planned, we called it an HIT conference. We had pre-meetings, uh, every meeting that we had, trying to learn more about what this was. Neil Newberger teaching us about meaningful use and the resource center starting out um, the HIT coalition that still works together today. That other quote, uh, when 
Don Berwick rolled out the triple aim, right? Our lives changed then. Uh, we knew we had to have that focus and it made it resonated with us really well. But again, we didn't know what does this mean? So again, we turned to each other. Uh, we turned to partners. Uh, and it wasn't, it was not too long shortly after that, that I believe the MV Quip program was born. And think about where that will go in the future about, you know, what you've learned about quality improvement and financial improvement from the Flex program. It, it can go beyond, way beyond those critical access hospitals that we just were imagining the possibility of 25 years ago. And then finally, the last little quote that I have up there was certainly around the adoption of the Affordable Care Act. I remember that day, I was sitting in McDonald's with my grandchildren who were visiting, and up on the screen was the president. Right behind him was a former North Dakota leader, Dr. Mary Wakefield. And I said, gosh, I know that person. And uh, that happened. And so much happened to impact your work. If you were around then, you remember, made a big difference, but it also had us scratching our heads and being afraid and having to pay attention to our partners and what was in the news and what did this mean? And we turned to each other once again, um, like we always do. Next slide, please. And then there was this, the pandemic. Uh, none of us ever imagined the possibilities of, of, of what that would be like. We should have. Um, we still have a lot to learn, um, but we did what we always do. We went back to communities. You all did. You went in your pickup trucks with delivery of uh, emergency supplies. Um, you listened to smart folks like John Suplet say there's going to be a shortage of masks. And that was even before the pandemic. I think there were there were all kinds of things that you all did to go back to community. You, you showed up at emergency response centers. Some of you might have felt like you were abandoning your flex program objectives sometimes, but you did what had to be done to respond to the worldwide pandemic. We relied on each other. We got on the phone and talked to each other and uh, for HP. And I, a last couple things. Um, I don't believe in silver linings. What I believe in when we people talk about silver linings is that we learn from flex. People got more flexible. They were innovative. They adopted. Uh, they were mindful. Uh, and everything that we do now, we have to be mindful that impact of the pandemic. We've gotten much better at data, I think. Uh, and we have stronger community connections. And, you know, I saw this little cartoon that says two people talking to each other, looking off into the sky and saying, when this is over, what will change? And the response was everything. And it's true. Everything should change. And I believe will change for the good next slide, please. And really, um, we have learned so much about health equity and the lack uh, thereof. We've become more self-aware and are building that into our programs along with our federal partners. We have to really understand that together we can make a difference uh, for rural communities and that as long as we focus on that equity and building an infrastructure that takes into mind all, everyone and our collective impact, I think that's so critical to our future and where we were at 25 years ago just teaches us more about it. And then finally, just a last couple of uh, words, uh, just uh, stay together. Next slide, please, man. I appreciate that. You know, we have to, one of the things that we're at now is it's really important to align all these programs. Uh, you have to align SOAR with SHIP and FLEX and, and uh, other programs that you've gotten the funding for over the years. And you become masters at that. You need to do it. You can't do it enough. Um, telling the story of rural health. Uh, please, folks, reach out on National Rural Health Day and do, I'll do my no SOAR plug. Please make a nomination of a community star. And then appreciate the support and the partnerships that we have. There's a new uh, proposed flex reauthorization uh, proposed in Congress. And Stephanie Nance from North Carolina had a great idea at our board meeting a couple weeks ago. What would happen if at every flex conference around the country, you took a pause and asked folks to write a thank you note or send a phone message to thank your congressional member for the work that they get, uh, that you are able to do because of the flex program. I'll leave you with that. That thought, and I'll turn things over to Tom. And thanks so much for the opportunity to share a little perspective on that history. Carol, thank you so much. Uh, it was it was interesting to to hear your remarks, and especially your nod to history, which I think you know is is always important to keep into account in all, in all that we do. 
And Flex does have a very interesting history that I think parallels the, uh, you know, so many developments that have happened in, in rural health more generally. But I think you also did a nice job of sort of talking about um, what the Flex program has done in terms of its relationship between state offices of rural health, between hospitals uh, and their communities. And I think it's done a, it, it's, it's played a really important role in creating a tighter bond there. I also appreciate uh, the, the references you made to relationships um, and, and your final point, I guess, where you talked about alignment, so important because so often, you know, you run a program, you tend to operate in a little bit of isolation um, and yet nothing operates in isolation. So the opportunity to take um, flex and make that work, uh, but also to keep in mind larger things happening in the healthcare system, incredibly important. And as you know, Terrell, we've had a lot of really important champions over the years uh, for the FLEX program. Um, some of them have come from the state office community, like, like John Bornis from Michigan. Um, some of them have also um, uh, been with the FLEX monitoring team, and uh, like John Gale. And we've also been lucky in the sense that, um, you know, we've had great champions from the hospital associations, uh, like Peggy Wheeler. And so, um, you know, as I think about all of that, and as I listen to you talk about Flex, uh, I think about all the work you've done through NOSOR to support Flex and over your time uh, leading that organization, and it dawns on me that you're one of those champions. Mm -hmm. We are. And so that's why I'm honored to tell you right now that you're the recipient of the 2022 Forest Calico Leadership mm -hmm. Award, um, and you really embody everything this award stands for. As, um, as many people know, well, maybe not many, because it's been quite a few years, uh, the Calico Award has created it to, to recognize outstanding rural health leadership. And, um, you know, Terrell, I think you fit that category perfectly. I was lucky enough to work with Forrest. I think you were too. He was a key champion of CHAs and, and, and really focusing on that link between quality improvement and small rural hospitals. And it was Dr. Calico who really, I think, played the lead role in, in aligning flex with that quality initiatives. He was the uh, he was in our office for a number of years, and one of the things he did was convince with by, well, he convinced them by paying them, but uh, the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Sciences, with creating this uh, report as part of their Crossing the Quality Chasm series. This is quality through collaboration. It really was the initial blueprint um, that guided the FLEX program. And, and so, um, you know, I think Forrest set the initial standard for us, and, and people at the hospital level, at the state level, and at the national level like you have then really embodied what that all stands for. And so I think you stand in good company uh, joining all of them, but I think they also stand in good company now that you're part of the club. So congratulations. Thank you, Tom. What an honor. Uh, Forrest was a great champion for uh, the Critical Access Hospital and a little bit of a curmudgeon sometime, which I loved about him. So thank you for that. What an honor. Back over to Sally. Thank you, Tom, and congratulations to Terrell, our 2022 Calico awardee. We're so thrilled for you. And next up is our plenary session, Rural Health Policy and Regulatory Updates. In today's session, we're gonna learn about um, the latest in legislation and, and regulatory uh, challenges and opportunities, um, especially for critical access hospitals in rural communities. And I will introduce our, our panelists. Um, they include Carrie Cornejo, and she is the policy coordinator in HRSA's Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. And in this role, she advises on regulatory and legislative and other policy issues affecting healthcare in rural communities. Carrie first joined FRHP in December 2016 as a public health analyst in the policy research division. And prior to FRHP, she worked in HRSA's Office of Planning, Analysis, Evaluation, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation in Newark at the University of Chicago. Our next panelist, Brock Slaybaugh. Brock joined NRHA, the National Rural Health Association, in 2008. He is NRHA's Chief Operating Officer and specializes in rural health system development that encompasses population health and the varied payment programs, moving rural providers into value-based purchasing models. Brock is a former critical access hospital administrator 
and he serves on the task advisory committee and is also a former Calico Award winner. And last but not least, John Supplin is their Senior Director of Rural Health Services for the American Hospital Association. Since 1993, John has worked with and on behalf of HA's 1,860 rural hospital members, including 1,000 critical access hospitals, to identify, develop, and advance their unique healthcare interests, issues, and perspective. He has served on several national panels and advisory groups for the development of national rural health policy and programs, including the Task Advisory Committee. And John is also a former Calico Award winner. So we will um, move into some prepared questions, but encourage the audience um, to post questions or comments in the chat box, and the task team will be monitoring that and we'll get through a, a few prepared questions and open it up. So let's dive in and start with legislation. What are the current legis legislative issues your organizations are pursuing to support critical access hospitals? And we'll start with John on this one. Well, thanks very much, Sally, and it's great to be here with Carrie and Brock. I think we're going to hit the ground running, and as you can look at the congressional work period, there's just not a lot of days left to accomplish much, and what has to be accomplished is some form of budget resolution, so most likely a continuing resolution that will kick the budget past the next election cycle in November. When that happens, what we're hoping for is that there'll be a number of, of the pri uh, priorities that we have that would be attached as amendments to that uh, continuing resolution. We'll have to see what happens, but as you can see, we're looking at about 16 days of congressional work in the House and uh, 26 in the Senate. And as we wade into what those priorities that, that may be that we're uh, presenting, is it starts with sequester, which has been on our radar forever. And there's two issues here. One is um, the suspension of the sequester for the National Public Health Emergency which happened as part of the American uh, re uh, Relief Plan. Um, it was suspended, 1% uh, was suspended in, through April, and then the second percent through July. Well, under the current circumstances, we're under a full sequester. So again, it's 2% less uh, uh, allowable costs for, for Medicare providers of critical access hospitals. And so what we need is Congress to take an action on that and to extend uh, um, and suspend the Medicare a sequester an additional amount of time so that again under especially under these circumstances our critical access hospitals aren't forced to work with a, a two percent less than an allowable cost the second issue here is the statutory pay as you go which aims to serve that on net enacted legislation affecting direct spending or revenues does not ex increase projected deficits and so the statutory pay goes of sequestration will will uh, go into effect january 1st and if it does, and if it's triggered, then we'll see an additional amount of cuts that will come as a result of sequestration. So again, we need Congress to act on both the PAYGO as well as the 2% um, uh, uh, sequestration that's part of the current budget cycle. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Brock and Carrie, and uh, they'll share with us what we might expect in terms of the fiscal year 2023 House or, or appropriations bill. Yeah, this is Brock here, and uh, thanks, John. And um, I do want to take a moment to congratulate Terrell on her award of the Forest Calico uh, designation. Well done and well deserved. Um, on the fiscal year 2023 House appropriations, uh, they're starting to do their work uh, in the very short period of time that the uh, Congress has left, uh, as John said, for the rest of the year to work. Uh, the, the four corners um, are having a difficult time coming up with top line spending numbers. Uh, they're arguing over the typical things that they do, and that's namely over how much defense we'll get versus the other programs within the federal government. But you see here a list of all of the appropriations that, um, that, we're, at, that we're all advocating for and wanting to see either uh, increases or uh, continued funding uh, into FY23, which starts October 1st. Um, if they go to a, a continuing resolution, like John said, then of course um, 
they'll just extend current year numbers um, into next year until they can resolve their budgetary issues. Um, I won't go over all of this list in detail, but um, I, I think they're all very important. You can see the rural flex line that's there. I will comment that we are advocating uh, strongly for increases even further into the implementation and conversion to rural emergency hospitals, which will need technical assistance and more support, I think, for that going forward. Um, I, Carrie, did you have any comments on a, on approach? I, I, I think there's some, maybe you and we had discussed beforehand that there might be some comments here from you on this. Yeah, really, I just want to note I'm excited. We're excited to see the um, RHC Behavioral Health Initiative in this report. Um, and in recent years, we've really done a lot more work with rural health clinics with the COVID programs. And then we were able to move on and you know, behavioral health is a big priority um, with this administration. So being able to work with that in the RHC setting is exciting to us. And that's my comment there. Great, great. Thank you both. And and as we mentioned, we're hoping that things will be attached to that as amendments going forward from our, our, our advocacy agenda. What I want to spend time now is the broader picture. There are many um, legislative actions that have taken place in this past Congress that are important for uh, all hospitals, including critical access. And I want to start with these broader issues, beginning with the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. And to review that the problem of assault and intimidation against hospitals, uh, excuse me, as you know, Congress passed and the president signed a bipartisan gun safety bill that includes narrow restrictions on firearm ownership. Uh, and the bill includes roughly 13 billion in new spending for policy programs like mental health and, and school safety. And we all share uh, 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 th this priority uh, and 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 uh, you know, gun violence is a public health initiative. So we're glad to see this in place. And from our purpose uh, at AHA, we do have an area on hospitals against violence and initiative. And we've partnered with the National Mass Violence Victimization Resource Center to provide additional uh, resources and support surrounding incidents of mass violence for the communities and the patients served by their hospitals and health systems. I wanted to touch base on a uh, bill that's been introduced, a bipartisan piece of legislation, the Safety from Violence for Healthcare Employees Act or the SAVE Act. And to give background here, according to an April 2020 Bureau of Labor Statistics report, the healthcare and social service industries experienced the highest rate of injuries caused by workplace violence and were five times as likely to suffer a workplace violence injury than workers overall in 2018. And the report also found that the incidence of workers had of violence against workers had steadily increased since 2011. The COVID-19 pandemic had exacerbated this growing problem with the most recent incident occurring at St. Francis Hospital in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So representatives Dean and uh, Buckshawn have introduced bipartisan legislation in the House uh, that would extend the healthcare workers federal protections against workplace violence, similar to those afforded to the aircraft and airport employees. Another piece of legislation that's important to all providers and especially rural is the Travel Nurse Agency Transparency Study Act. And in June, legislation was introduced that would direct the Government Accountability Office or GAO to study the travel nursing industry's business and payment practices, including their impact on workforce shortages and the potential price gouging that occurred during the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, the effects of travel nurse agencies on healthcare include um, consideration of business practices, payment practices, and the specific ways in which rural areas of the United States were affected by the rise of travel nursing across the country, and then the subsequent workforce shortage disparities. Another piece of legislation introduced that's important to all of us is the Restoring Hope for Mental Health and Wellbeing Act, which is, again, bipartisan legislation that introduces reauthorizing through 2027 of more than 30 programs that support mental health care, prevention, education, and workforce training. The bill addresses maternal mental health and substance use disorders and requires the secretary to maintain a national hotline to provide mental health and substance use disorder resources to pregnant and postpartum women and their families. 
Another important piece of legislation is the Seniors Timely Access to Care Act. And this bill establishes several requirements and standards related to prior authorization processes under Medicare Advantage. Specifically, Medicare Advantage plans must establish an electronic prior authorization program that meets specified standards, including the ability to provide real-time decisions in response to requests for items and services that are routinely approved. To annually publish specific prior authorization information, including the percentage of requests approved and their average response time. And then third, meet other standards as set by CMS relating to the quality and timeliness of prior authorization determinations. With that, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll conclude. That was the discussion of, of major bills that have been introduced that are, uh, uh, will impact all hospitals, but you can see their relevance to critical access. And let's segue now to the rural hospital legislative update. And I'm gonna turn this over to Brock to walk us through that. Thank you, John. Um, this slide set will be available to everyone following this presentation, if not already. So I'm not gonna go through every one of these bills individually, but we did uh, categorize them by title or by topic. So you can uh, look at the topic and then refer to the bill that addresses that particular issue. Um, there are two bills that have been introduced that protect rural hospitals, and this includes the extenders that are due to expire September 30. Um, I know that it's important to mention uh, that the Medicare dependent hospital and the low volume hospital programs are in need of reauthorization um, or otherwise they will expire at the end of this fiscal year. Um, I know AHA and NRHA and other associations are vigorously uh, wanting those to be included in the continuing resolution um, and uh, make sure that those supports uh, continue. A, a huge issue, I've talked with three hospitals just in the last two weeks that are considering, in rural areas that are considering uh, closing their obstetric units. And uh, there are four pieces of legislation out there that have been introduced to continue the focus on this real problem of maternity deserts nationwide. We have seen through the pandemic, um, public health being decimated in terms of its uh, resource, not only resources, but in personnel and mostly impacting rural communities. And so we're in support of the, um, uh, the Prevent Pandemics Act um, I should also mention, and I forgot, that the Critical Access Hospital Relief Act does address the 96-hour rule on conditions of payment. So that's a very important, uh, a very important uh, feature to that bill as well. So everyone needs to be supporting uh, these particular pieces of legislation. Uh, next slide. Uh, workforce. Um, John and Carrie and myself, I mean, I think that whenever I'm in any conversation with hospitals around the country, critical access hospitals, workforce is at the top of everyone's concern. Um, here is a list of the important pieces of legislation that addressed workforce. Um, the Conrad State 30 and reauthorizing that program is incredibly important. Uh, the Rural America Health Corps, uh, the future advancement of academic nursing, we've got to improve the clinical nursing instructor situation so that we can train more nurses and have and that have, have our educational facilities not be a bottleneck. The Resident Physician Shortage Reduction Act and then um, expedite visas for highly trained foreign healthcare workers. And these all together have been, and we would like to see passed in order to continue staffing appropriately our rural workforce. Next slide. Telehealth has become a staple of many of our operations in rural facilities, uh, especially since uh, through and since the pandemic. Um, so these are bills that all address uh, in one form or another, the issues of the uh, expirations at the end of the public health emergency for distant sites provider, uh, distant site status for rural health clinics and federally qualified health centers. Um, these acts will, will, will address those. And we're excited that um, that Congress seems to be willing to engage with us on this, although they're not as quite as in, enthused about extending the distance site status and payment uh, for telehealth uh, 
And there's a lot of reasons for that, but we're working through those with Congress. And of course, I uh, want to see this continue. Uh, Protect 340B. Um, obviously, we're very disheartened about the effects of uh, lack of contract pharmacy uh, coverage for our rural hospitals, particularly critical access hospitals. And we are thinking now that legislation is required uh, to fix some of the intractable problems that have been seen uh, in the 340B program. So this bill is very important and we're supporting this. Last but not least, as Terrell mentioned in, in her presentation, emergency medical services. And we need to make sure that we protect ground ambulance services, particularly making sure we extend that, um, um, that ambulance add-on, the rural ambulance add-on payment. Uh, that's so critical for uh, rural rural EMS providers. Next slide. Uh, rural substance use disorder, as John mentioned and has been reported earlier, uh, we're seeing really high rates of uh, rural substance use disorders uh, in rural communities, and we need to extend uh, what's already been uh, featured in our core and um, other rural programs. Here are some other programs that uh, I rep uh, I'll reference for you in terms of uh, a bills addressing that issue. And I think that concludes the legislative report. Thank you, Brock. And now we'll turn to Carrie, who's going to provide some updates on policy regulations and rulemaking specifically um, impacting critical access hospitals. Mm -hmm. So thank you. I just want to take a moment to cover some recent rulemaking that I think this group will be interested in. Um, on the first slide here, um, just I want to give you a quick update on a recent announcement from HRSA related to health professional shortage areas or HIPSAs. So on July 7th, the Bureau of Health Workforce put a notice in the Federal Register. And basically what that said is that HIPSA designations that are uh, currently proposed for withdrawal will remain designated in proposed for withdrawal status until they're reevaluated in preparation for the 2023 HIPSA notice. And this additional time will allow jurisdictions to reevaluate their HIPSAs against the designation criteria and then plan for potential changes in staffing. Uh, moving on to the next item here is the Rural Emergency Hospital uh, Conditions of Participation proposed rule. This is a big um, rule that we've been anticipating for a while. Uh, CMS made their REH policy proposals in two rules this year. Uh, so this is the first one. I'll also talk um, after this about the um, REH payment policies and the outpatient prospective payment system rule. Um, but CMS is proposing a number of conditions of participation. And I just want to walk through just a few key items. Uh, I would note that CMS is accepting public comments on these proposals through August 29th. And generally, CMS proposed standards for REHs that closely align with the current cost COPs in most cases, though taking into account the unique nature of REHs and their statutory requirements. Um, in some instances, the pros RH policies closely align to the current hospital and ambulatory surgical center standards, like the policies for outpatient services and the life safety code. Uh, just a few things I want to run through. First, CMS would certify a facility as an REH if it was, as of December 27th of 2020, a critical access hospital or a hospital with no more than 50 beds located in a rural area. And hospitals located in metro counties must have had an active reclassification for urban to rural as of that December 27th date if they'd like to convert to an REH. Um, regarding emergency services, CMS uh, seeks comment on the appropriateness of not requiring a practitioner to be on site at the REH at all times, but to be available on call. Uh, for REHs providing maternal health services, CMS believes it would be beneficial to include um, prenatal care and low-risk low labor and delivery, though they're seeking input on whether or not REHs uh, should be required to provide outpatient surgical services in the event of labor and delivery interventions. And just as noted in the statute, REHs must have an effect in a agreement with at least one level one or level two trauma center. There are just a few items relevant to, there's a few items relevant to cause in this proposed rule that I just want to highlight quickly for you as well. Um, for cause, the proposed rule includes it, uh, the establishment of a patient rights uh, COP, allowing for unified and integrated systems for infection control and antibiotic stewardship, and then revising the regulations to add a definition for primary roads. So a primary road for determining the driving distance would be a numbered federal highway or a numbered state highway with two or more lanes each way. And CMS is interested in feedback on whether the definition should exclude numbered federal highways with only one lane in each direction. And then if finalized, CMS would review all hospitals and CAWs within a 50 mile radius of the CAW during each review of eligibility and then subsequently on a three year cycle. 
Uh, moving on to the next slide, I just want to cover the CMS OPPS proposed rule that came out last week. CMS is accepting comments on this rule through September 13th. Um, as I mentioned, this includes the rural emergency hospital payment proposals. Uh, so first, CMS is proposing that all covered outpatient department services paid under the OPPS would be REH services, and they be paid at the OPPS rate plus 5%. And I would note that beneficiaries um, won't be charged the co-insurance and the additional 5% payment. And REHs can provide outpatient services not paid under the OPPS as well as post-hospital extended care, but these wouldn't be eligible for the um, additional 5% payment. Also per statute, REHs will receive a fixed monthly facility payment. Um, CMS proposes that the monthly facility payment for REHs for calendar year 2023 would be roughly $268,000 or just over $3.2 million annually. And then starting in 2024, the additional facility payment would be increased by the hospital market basket uh, percentage. There's also updates in there for REHs related to physician self-referral and provider enrollment. Uh, the proposed rule also discusses quality measures reported by cause in small rural hospitals and requests comments on what measures would be appropriate for REHs. Another item in this rule is regarding 340B drugs. Um, I won't go over this in too much detail, but just because of the Supreme Court decision um, ruling against CMS's payment policy on 340B acquired drugs, uh, CMS will have to make some updates in the final rule. Um, I would note though that cause had been excluded um, from this payment policy in the past. Um, and then in the area of behavioral health, CMS is proposing to cover telebehavioral health services furnished remotely to beneficiaries in their homes by clinical staff of ho hospital outpatient departments, including the staff of CAUSE. Uh, moving on to the next slide, I just want to spend a little bit of time covering the proposals in the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule proposed rule, which includes policies on ACOs in the Medicare Shared Savings Program, behavioral health, and telehealth. Uh, so for ACOs, this includes policy proposals designed to support participation in rural and underserved communities. This includes providing advanced investment payments, smoothing the transition to performance-based risk, creating more opportunities for ACOs to share in savings, and updating the financial methodology. Uh, just a quick note on the advanced investment payments, they'd be a one-time fixed payment of $250,000 with quarterly payments for the first two years of the five-year agreement period, and then CMS uh, will only recoup that payment if a the ACO does achieve shared savings. And CMS is also making some adjustments um, in response to concerns on the risk-bearing requirements uh, requiring ACOs to bear financial losses, bear risk for financial losses in the model. Um, so they're allowing new ACOs to stay in one-sided risk periods for longer and then allowing all ACOs to remain in tracks with lower risk levels. So a couple things on behavioral health. Uh, CMS is proposing to allow licensed professional counselors and marriage and family therapists to provide services under general rather than direct supervision. Uh, they're also proposing to cover opioid treatment and recovery services for mobile units like vans to increase access in rural areas. And then for telehealth, CMS is proposing to extend those Medicare telehealth flexibilities uh, for 151 days after the end of the public health emergency. And then on the next slide, this is my last update. Um, just like the telehealth policies, the future end of the public health emergency also has ramifications for coverage and coverage losses under Medicaid. I would note though, um, so this would come at the end of the public health emergency, but I would note that the administration just extended the PHE for at least another 90 days. Um, so this slide lays out the various Medicaid flexibilities that were afforded with the PHE declaration and when those flexibilities would go away at the end of the PHE. Um, you can see highlighted in red just different provisions and at different times, and um, it's dependent on the state as well. Um, so now I'm going to turn the presentation back over to John to cover some policies related to the 340B program. Thanks very much, Carrie. And as Carrie mentioned, in the outpatient prospective payment rule, CMS has acknowledged that it will have to reimburse our, our hospitals that are participating in the 340B program, 36 and a half, or 32 and a half percent of the money that they had cut uh, from them over the past three years. And the reason for that was the U.S. Supreme Court ruled on June 15th unanimous, unanimously in favor of hospitals reversing the 2020 appeals decision that upheld the authority of HHS to cut these payments. The impact is about $1.6 billion annually and we're looking for rapid um, reimbursement of that as a result of the Supreme Court's ruling. With respect to contract pharmacy, the number of drug companies that are restricting discount pricing for hospitals in the 340B program has steadily increased to 17 
despite the government warnings that the practice violates the law. Some stopped giving 340B ceiling prices on drugs sold to providers. Others limited sales by selling products only after a covered entity had demonstrated 340B compliance or release data. The impact is heightened on small role providers like critical access hospitals, where a 39% average loss evens out to about 448,000 a year per critical access hospital. A tenth of those facilities are going to lose $700,000 or more. If the restrictions became permanent, more than three quarters of facilities said that they'd have to cut services and patient support programs and a third of the smaller, mostly rural hospitals said restrictions might put them at risk of closure. And HRSA has moved to hold drug manufacturers accountable. Um, and, and in turn, drug manufacturers have taken HRSA to court. Nevertheless, HRSA is renewing its enforcement in the face of these legal challenges. And the most recent letter has been issued to Merck to stop its illegal activity in the term of limiting access to 340B drugs through contract pharmacy arrangements. And we all are supportive of the HHS's legal efforts to enforce contract pharmacy obligations of drug manufacturers. Regarding the No Surprises Act, there are two main issues here. One is the federal independent dispute resolution process, and the second is the good faith estimate. With respect to the independent resolution process, um, it was put in place by the act to provide a mechanism for health plans and out-of-network providers to resolve payment disputes for out-of-network services. The issue has been the government's implementing rule on what factors the IDR arbiters would consider when making these determinations. Now, CMS has already opened the portal and, and uh, uh, we're awaiting the final rule that should officially clarify the factors that the federal arbiters can use when making determinations about network pay payment disputes between plans and providers. Then the second issue with respect to uninsured and self-pay good faith estimates, we understand that the implementation has been quite burdensome already for, for rural hospitals. And we're also pulling together a work group that includes representatives from other provider groups and the vendor community to push enforcement discretion for this piece of the uninsured good faith estimate requirement until a standard definition is implemented and identified. At this point, Sally, I'll turn it back to you. I think you're on mute. We had a couple of questions in the chat box, so we'll go to those before um, going to the, the next question. Um, Brock, would you like to um, there was a question about um, support for state offices of rural health in the rural advocacy agenda. Correct. Um, yes. So in appropriations uh, requests, we have increased and it would like to see through legislation the increase in the allocation of money for grants to states for operating their um, offices of rural health. So. Uh, this is um, in addition to increased in flex funding and 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 other uh, line item requests that we've made. Uh, this is certainly part of our uh, agenda as well. Okay. Thanks, Tim. That we have one other question: Does the proposed rule for rural emergency hospitals include the option for observation beds as well? <clears throat> and there was one example from Massachusetts. And I'll let Brock start, and then Carrie, if you have any comments as well. The short answer to the question is yes, um, and uh, that is a, a nice way of being able to extend care um, beyond just the emergency and perhaps the patient doesn't need to be transferred, uh, just maybe observed for a period of time uh, before discharge. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just to add, if you'd be interested in seeing the regulatory language on that piece. I know our, I was just talking with our subject matter expert on the REH rule and we can um, feel free to reach out and we can help identify that for you. Okay, thank you, Carrie. So next up, we're thinking about the proposed policies and implementing new regulations. What are the operational priorities small rural hospitals and clinics should be focusing on? And I'll start with John here. 
Well, well and Brock has mentioned it, and, and I concur, and as Carrie will as well, in, in every meeting that we have, the, the highest priority issue now is no longer reimbursement, it's workforce, and the shortages and the responses to that. And we've talked about a number of, of pieces of legislation that have been introduced as part of the advocacy agendas for our, our organizations and some of the responses we've gotten to that. But when you go to the field then and talk and, and folks talk as to how they're addressing it in real time, you can see on the slides some of the examples of the way in which it's being done in, in community hospitals across the country. And, and um, you, you know, it, it takes a lot of resourcefulness. Maybe these ideas aren't particularly new, but the way they're being implemented locally most definitely are. And so I'll leave those up there as a reference point um, and, a, and something that you can revisit. But there are, are when you ask among your peers across the country how they're addressing the shortage of, of not just clinical staff, but all staff, these are some of the ideas that they've come forward with and have implemented locally. And Jen, just to, to review in terms of the advocacy and policy, it's stabilization, it's expediting the visas, dispersing any remaining funds for pri uh, provider relief, using the FTC to investigate reports of anti-competitive behavior among nursing agencies. With respect to well-being, it's supporting healthcare workers and the behavioral health needs and to spread best practices to prevent burnout. And then with regard to educational pipeline, it's lifting the cap on Medicare funding for physician residencies, boosting support for nursing schools and faculty, and then providing uh, scholarships and loan forgiveness. Another priority that we continue to hear about is the supply chain issues, and particularly it's the uh, shortage of contrast media for CT imaging. Um, we are working to identify con uh, conservation strategies, and the shortage once again has pointed to the need to improve the resiliency of the supply chain. And as we've discussed in the past, these efforts have to include taking steps to encourage and strengthening domestic manufacturing and production in nearby countries and to dip deepen the supply chain to enable continued availability of the critical supplies and medications. The FDA has established the Resilient Supply Chain Program for Medical Devices to enhance their capacity to prevent and mitigate supply chain interruptions. And the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response is leading a multi-agency, multi-stakeholder effort to identify ways to make the supply chain more resilient. And Carrie, you want to touch on this? Yeah, just looping back to the theme on, on health equity um, and just leaving you with kind of this, uh, some reflections on our work. Um, we think, you know, health equity is foundational to what we do here in the office. Um, always making sure that, you know, rural is considered in policymaking, uh, trying to advance rural health equity through our programs. I, the, um, the administration put out an executive order on um, health equity in 2021. And from following from that, there was an HHS health equity plan and CMS has their, their framework as well. Um, so you see some of that work and um, we achieve our health equity priorities by working with these other agencies as well. I think maternal health is an area that's a good example of how we've worked with other agencies on, on health equity. We have our Our Moms program. Um, there was also the birthing friendly designation, hospital quality designation that CMS um, put out. And our job here um, in the regulatory review process and our relationship with CMS is to make sure that um, there are no unintended consequences or to mitigate unintended co consequences for rural communities and to make sure that that is kept, um, that perspective is kept alive within the department. Um, so just know that we're working hard on this and maternal health is definitely a good example, I think. Thanks, Carrie. And Brock, would you like to share opportunity advanced health equity, perhaps in, in some of the quality improvement and measurement? Yeah. Oh, thank you, Sally. Um, and in the short time that we have left, I'll just say that um, you'll see permeating regulations that are promulgated, um, and Carrie, Carrie mentioned several of them, uh, the emphasis on health equity. And one of the real uh, problems that we have is how do we measure uh, these uh, different aspects of care as it relates to equity? 
And I know the National Quality Forum, uh, through its Rural Advisory Task Force, is working very hard uh, to try to grapple with this question. Um, and we really need to understand um, how we under how we know we're making progress um, in this particular um, area. And I know, uh, but it is a priority. We're seeing it mentioned more often, and and it is something that I know all of our organizations are very uh, alert to. Great. Thank you, Brock. And thank you to um, our panelists, Carrie Cornejo. Oh, John, go ahead. Yeah, real quick. Um, the AHA has the Institute for Diversity and Health Equity, and it's the largest and only uh, private not-for-profit organization dedicated to that cause. And it has the roadmap to health equity. And what I would ask the flex coordinators to do is to download and look at the roadmap to health equity because it can be applied to all hospitals and it's scalable regardless of size. And what it does, it allows the, the hospital's leadership, board and, and uh, executive leadership, to see where they stand relative to uh, uh, metrics and measures of health equity within their organization. And it gives them an opportunity to reflect on where they are and where they need to be and then add that to their strategy and their community health needs assessment moving forward. So thanks very much for that. Oh, great. Thank you, John. And we can put that in the materials section of the attendee hub as well. Great. So again, um, thank you for those um, very up-to-date, timely um, comments on legislation and regulatory and policy issues for rural communities and hospitals. Um, I know there were even updates on Friday after the outpatient <laughs> rule. So next up, we are um, going to have a 15 minute break. Um, so we invite you to uh, stretch and get your steps in, um, your, a drink of water and get ready for an exciting um, breakout session. And we have three different ones to choose from and you can find those Zoom links um, in the attendee hub starting at 1.30 central time. Thanks everyone.